Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea on see the show on your TV so we can talk about things musically. Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea. You're listening to Jams and Tea. Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of the Jams Tea Podcast where we spin the jams and spill the tea and today we are coming at you with a brand new Record Club episode and today we are covering August Record Club recommendation which is Basehead. Basehead. A, uh, at this point a kind of uh, unknown, more obscure kind of uh, some shade of hip hop uh, project based out of Washington, D.C., headed by the one and only Michael Ivey. So I figure I should give some context into why we're covering this, what this is. So a bit of the reason I wanted to cover this is obviously something that's already been alluded to. It's very weird placement within genre and how you it's very hard to nail down. It doesn't sound like a whole lot of what came out, like a whole lot of anything that came out uh, in its time. And speaking of its time, also that this record has been forgotten because there is a, a bit of a key fact. Spin Magazine, pretty big in music journalism. This album was released in 1992 and was their ninth best album of the year, above Tom Waits's Bone Machine and PJ Harvey's Dry. So, oh, wow. I had to ask the question, how did this get forgotten? And that was the question I wanted to answer with this review for us to kind of delve into if we think this, uh, this deserves its place or if it was rightfully washed away by the seas of time. So uh, who would like to uh, go first? I enjoy this album quite a bit. Um, it's interesting that it has sort of been lost to the annals of music history in a way. So I feel like if this had gotten released like five years ago or even maybe three, uh, it would have done really well. Um, given the fact that I think what this is doing in the genres, it blends um, despite maybe the the, uh, the drum beat specifically sounding very sort of 80s and 90s still, um, would have fit much better into the landscape what was happening then. I thought a lot of Kevin Abstract's Arizona Baby listening to this record, for example, um, in the way, oh, in, like for, with the song Georgia, it blends sort of rap and R&B and acoustic, a sort of rock and folk instrumentation, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I enjoy it very much. I there are moments where I find the skits like insufferable. Um, like there's a moment after the song um, Evening News where they go back and forth for about a minute on, uh, no, like he has to give a solution to the problem, man. No, but it's like a song, you can't get this. And that goes on for like a minute. And I just, I got the point is what I want to say. Um, but no, um, the, it starts off the first half is about uh, a breakup, I think. Um, and it goes into many of those things in really interesting ways. And the second half is much more about like systemic oppression. Um, and I found that broke back structure really interesting. Um, but overall, what I really engage with this album on the level of is um, there is a sort of a gimmick to the uh, persona telling this record to you, I suppose. Um, and I enjoyed spending time with this like fictional band in this fictional bar. Uh, I enjoyed the sort of feeling that I might be in a quiet corner nursing a pint or a, or a double shot of whiskey and just uh, like reading a book or doing some work as I want to do in sort of bars outside of a pandemic situation. Um, and just listening to the sort of lounge uh, act or, or this sort of live pub act go through their very sort of strange and atmospheric set list. Um, I could well imagine in a fantasy universe where I haven't been living in a fucking home county all of my life, um, that uh, this is an act that you might actually find in a city playing a particularly hipstery bar. Um, and I would like to be there. I would like to hear Mr. Head play. Um, 
and yeah i found it was also very funny for me when they brought in the people around them like uh the outro especially i laughed many times listening that is very stupid but uh it was charming i think um and yeah i would i would like to see what a modern audience not a modern audience but a slightly pre-contemporary audience today would have made this record mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting album. Uh, it was not what I was expecting. I don't, <laughs> it's hard to know. I, I, I guess, to be fair, I, I didn't really like have any idea what this was before get, getting into it. Uh, I, I read that it was alternative hip hop. But honestly, to me, I don't really hear a lot of hip hop in this. I mean, obviously in some of the beats and, 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 and stuff and, and some of the, rhythmic aspects of it I suppose but to me this felt more indebted to almost dream pop at points psychedelic mm. music uh even a bit of alternative rock music just not I'd say R&B too pretty heavily yeah. yeah not necessarily in the sound but just in kind of some of the aesthetic choices and the way that um the performers on this record came across uh I'd like to make clear from the outset in case anyone isn't aware what base head means oh uh, yeah this is important so base head is, a, is but yeah base head is street slang for a person who smokes free base crack cocaine as immortalized in public enemies classic track night of the living base heads which was on their classic record it takes a nation of billions to hold us back um and so that was the first thing i thought of when I read the band name Basehead, I'm like, okay, so that's interesting. Uh, I, I, and and Basehead play with toys made me think this was going to be like an IDM record or something. But no, it, it's very mellow, uh, and I definitely enjoy the uh, the aesthetic of that. Um, I like the back and forth of Brand New Day, uh, where both vocalists sound like Snoop Dogg at various stages of blazing up. <laughs> Um, sorry, I just maybe that's an obvious uh, vocal comparison, but um, it's not like they're super. Oh, they you're, sound, you're right. It's not like they sound super close to Snoop Dogg, but just like, yeah, I just thought of that. Um, the chord changes on the hook of this song are nice too, completely shift the tone of the track from the rest of it. I will say though that I find the placement of skits or interruptions in the middle of songs to be quite annoying. Um, but I will at least give them credit for all those skits credit for allowing our central characters to show a little more personality and for painting a more accurate portrait of their drug induced stupor. Um, what I, the record actually that this reminded me of the most, and it's not that it sounds a lot like it, but the way that it's structured and the way that with these skits and also with the live setting is it reminded me of the Tom Waits live album, Nighthawks at the Diner which is like Tom Waits basically just improvising these songs. Uh, what's, what's interesting about that record is that it's presented as a live album, but it was actually recorded in the studio. And Tom brought in like people to pretend to be like a crowd of people in a live setting, you know, like applauding and making noises and stuff. And it's like this, this fake live album. And I feel like Bass Head are kind of trying to do a similar thing structurally with, with this as well. Uh, and I, I, while I find Nighthawks at Diner to be kind of like a bit tedious because it's like 70 minutes long and, and, and Tom just ambles on and on and on, um, Bass Head are obviously adapting that kind of format to this kind of hazy, smoke filled barroom vibe. Um, and I, I have to say, I don't find it superbly compelling i think that there are limitations in the aesthetic and style um that the duo or band uh run upon fairly quickly um but that's not to say that there aren't plenty of individual moments on this record that sound great and that are relaxing and and uh strangely alluring uh, I will say the sung vocals in Not Over You uh, reminded me weirdly enough, and go with me on this, hang with me on this comparison, the sung vocals on this track reminded me of like Matt Berninger, uh, not Alligator era Matt Berninger, I'm talking like late era Matt Berninger, like 
Trevor will find me sleep well best where he's got this gin soaked voice where he's kind of like slowly ambling through um, through his lines. Uh, I was reminded of that delivery, which I thought was obviously a comparison that's just a, quali- a product of me, but it, it gave me an appreciation for the particular kind of like uh, vocal style that was happening there and, and the whole thing, gin soaked and, and, you know, on a bunch of substances, not like clear headed, but just pulling you along. Uh, I did find the ethereal orgasmic moans of hair to be a little much. Um, and, and, yeah. and the minimal melody and beat on that track, I thought were quite monotonous, to be honest. Um, the concept and tone of evening news, which is like you're stoned out of your gourd and you're trying to process some shit that's happening and the news is playing in the background and you're just trying to like uh, disentangle all these different like pieces of stimulation while you're completely, you know, off your nut. And I thought that was kind of a cool concept for a song. Uh, I really dug the, the particular kind of narcotic flow and downbeat chord progression of I Try which actually reminded me a bit of slow core and some of the more kind of, again, slower alternative bands around this 90s time, um, like Pygmalion era Slow Divers, I guess not that far away either. Um, on the title track, I think you can hear shades of how the influence of early trip hop is found in this sound, particularly Massive Attack's Blue Lines, which might be an obvious comparison, but I would flat out not believe you not believe them if they said they weren't listening to that record a lot while making this because it came out just a year prior and you can it, you can definitely hear the similarities between the two even if I find blue lines to be much more kind of hard-hitting and exciting from a moment-to-moment basis this I think is a record that it, I have to remind myself serves likely serves a particular purpose which is to soundtrack a particular state of mind that I most certainly wasn't in any of the times that I listened to it. Um, but you can hear the influence of, of blue lines and in particular, again, narcotic sound that uh, integrates hip hop with R&B and, and other kind of uh, psychedelic sounds. Uh, and you can hear the influence that this would then have on other sort of artists in a similar vein as well, like Tricky, for instance, um, I think was likely listening to this record in tandem with uh, Blue Lines when he made Max and Quay. Um, but yeah, so coming shortly after Blue Lines, um, yeah, I can see how this may have influenced future efforts. And I think it's a cool and early and perhaps more obscure example of, of what was happening in that particular scene. And yeah, I, I, to be honest, I don't really have a tremendous amount to say about this record. I, I found it pleasant. I found it at times grating. Um, yeah, there were points at which it felt like it was in conflict with itself, like with the way that the it seems to be trying to create this very consistent vibe. And then it kind of just interrupts itself with some of the more irreverent moments in the songs. And that kind of took me out of it, the experience. Uh, quite a bit but yeah generally speaking I thought that it was fine I uh, enjoyed it quite a bit and it's certainly not the kind of thing I would have sought out on my own and I think it gives me a little bit more of an understanding and an appreciation for a particular point in music and alternative music at this time. Right. Yeah. I do think it's interesting that Wikipedia Almost everywhere I can find calls this record alternative um, hip hop because what else? What else do you call it? You know, but it's yeah. so many things. Yeah, that's that's just what's so so interesting about it. How it takes this kind of wide uh, melting pot of ideas and blends it into a, a singular sound that's just kind of kind of tough to nail down for sure. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Drake. Or well, more? Uh, this album's really good. Um, I I wish I could expound in more detail like Tyler did, but I guess um, I will actually for once in my life come to bat for the defense of the skits. 
I, I don't know what it is exactly, but there's something about the way this is all presented that makes it feel very natural. Like whenever they happened, they never really interrupted what was going on enough to the point where I was just like, oh, this is stopping the, the, the record from happening. Like a lot of the time it's sort of like built into the, the instrumental in a way. And there's just such a weirdly compelling thing about them. I, I find it interesting that he's got like the Miss, Mr. Basshead. Um, dude's kind of got like this one friend that keeps kind of recurring who like, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if this is like a thing anyone else is gonna understand, but it's like, have you ever tried to talk to people about art and music who clearly don't consume it the way that you do? And then they just yeah. like, they just yeah. kind of start saying shit. That's this guy's friend who keeps yeah. coming up. Like when he's no, describing like, the well, song uh, and he's just like, when you're putting out all those feelings and and, and, and emotions to, yeah. to be heard by other people. And I'm just like, I have had yeah, this conversation yeah, yeah. with someone before yeah, it's and it's like, he really says, weird. Um, uh, <laughs> putting out a lot of expression that I can't express myself. Yeah. Um, and like he also gives him shit earlier on the record for just being like, you know, he's like, oh, why are you being so like moody and mopey all the time? And why are you always, uh, why are you always being all mm. depressed and shit? And I just get this really weird image of this friendship dynamic between the main character who's like this dude who's obviously like depressed and he's talking about, uh, you know, like feeling lonely and stuff on the album. It's kind of got that sort of light and airy R&B kind of feel to it a lot of the time. Um, there, there are times where like, it's obviously not as, I would say sonically intricate or even like remotely as jazzy, but there are just times where I was reminded of Nuja Bees and there's there's just this weird sort of like kind of night club sort of like like, like he's kind of performing this live and like other people can see him and there's also just like I don't know that the, the, every part of it that's like not the actual music is woven in in a way where it's like I get a picture of the dude who's singing it like his life and how he like works I guess and his like f his, his very uh try hard um friend who doesn't really get it but he's trying to he's he's doing his best god bless him um but i also just find a lot of the like lyrics and ideas like i think tyler talked about um the i can't remember what the song name was i kept listening to this in youtube where i didn't look at the individual song names a lot but it was it's the one where he's like trying to process all of this shit while he's also kind of stoned and it's like yeah evening report it is. Yeah, yeah evening report and i'm just like wow this is what the last entire year of my fucking life has felt like wow it's amazing how it was able to summarize that he's just always talking about like oh seeing shit on the news and trying to process things and i'm like yeah it's i feel you man i i think if this has any missteps it's just got moments where even though it's not a particularly long record i find the production to be just a bit too sparse where i would have liked a little bit more variation because like it is an album that's constantly like it's pretty dynamic it's shifting itself up a lot um i also just like that one little interplay that one little uh skit they have of him like when he turns the radio station he's like what you want me to fucking put on don't worry be happy and he just flips the radio <laughs> station over and it's playing uh ain't no sunshine he's just like come yeah, on yeah. man fuck you bring that one <laughs> like that one, that one made on me that. laugh yeah the timing on that one is impeccable it's just like Ain't no sunshine <laughs> and they just give you, it man? like a beat and it's just like man fuck you <laughs> Like, I like control the radio. This ain't my fault. <laughs> <laughs> like again, it's 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 lively. I I I I care for it, but I do there there are just parts where I feel like Mr. Mr. Basshead is perhaps not changing it up in the vocal delivery enough or just the production itself isn't as different as it is on other tracks. Like it just needs a little bit more variety for it to like truly stick with me. Like I enjoyed it. I think it's really good and I appreciate a lot of its influence and stuff and just on its own i think it's a good record i just think that like with a little bit more density this thing could be like a classic that i could see myself revisiting but like as is it's a it's something that i appreciate from a little bit more of a distance but i i, I like its overall it's it's energy it's intent i can see why like 
I bet you that Earl Sweatshirt like loves this album. Like I bet yeah. he fucking adores this yeah, shit because his entire career is like found exactly here. That's that's exactly who I think of whenever I like have this record in my head. It's just like, oh yeah, this this is where Earl Sweatshirt got a lot of ideas, huh? Mm-hmm. Damn straight. Yeah, I enjoyed this a fair bit. It's in some ways, I find it really interesting that it wasn't like hugely influential at the time because it sounds like it sounds like a sound that would really uh, take off in this in the early '90s. Um, but and and once you get to like sort of the back half of the album, it's like, oh, that's that's why it didn't really take off. There's no variety here. Um, which is really the album's big problem. I think it just gets really repetitive after a certain point. Um, I find the the atmosphere it creates and the production styles used to be too samey throughout. But when it when it hits, it hits. You know, I am also going to co-sign uh, Jake's perspective that the skits on this are actually quite good. Um, I enjoyed most of those. Um, one, because, you know, unlike most skits on hip hop albums, they actually made me laugh. Um, and for another, I just didn't find them all that intrusive. But yeah, I think there are a lot of really great core ideas here that I would have loved to have seen flesh out over the the duration of a career because I think there's something really special here, but I think it, I think it's a bit limited as is. Important bit to understand about this album is that uh, this was a record for the most part uh, created solely by our, our lead vocalist, Michael Ivy. He did all of the, guitar work every every voice and character is just him with his uh with the tones kind of pitched up and down to to create this feeling of another person and also on the note of the production which i do think is a great point to bring up uh this entire and this this is just a, a bit of an insight uh the entire record was recorded on like only four tracks of tape, I believe it was. So that that definitely does contribute to a bit of the a bit of the more limited, uh, not so bombastic kind of stripped back sound we get. Maybe even contributes a bit to the uh, uh, repetition of the whole thing. But their the career of Bayside, I think, is is interesting in a sense, in that you you all have mentioned kind of this point of like I uh, I would have loved to see where this where this took me or where this went next. And I think the story of that is quite interesting because you've got this album, gets a great deal of critical acclaim. Then we move into their second record. Uh, not in Kansas anymore, which gets some some similar acclaim, certainly not as as hyped up and by a lot of critics uh, considered a bit less ambitious, but nearly as good was uh, one of the quotes I read. And that that kind of gives you a bit of a sense of like, they were going, they were kind of developing this sound, but then this kind of drugged out, uh, drug addled sound, which to my understanding was curbed a lot from Michael Ivey's kind of real life and just how he was, how he was really living. Uh, but what, what makes this interesting is in 19... 95 he had a i it was 1995 1996 he had a spiritual awakening where all of a sudden he 
made a sharp left turn in his career to distance himself from this very drugged out hazy sound to produce music that was that had a lot more uh, Christian thematic stuff going on for it. So I I have to speculate, and those records are received quite poorly by contrast. Uh, the first two basshead records on Rate Your Music and Sputnik sitting in like the, the mid threes, three out of fives, and the follow-up record sitting in the uh, kind of low twos. So that that's just kind of the career career uh, trajectory we we see with this band, and uh, I have to speculate that perhaps it was that that lack of development of this sound, which could have potentially uh, kneecapped where they went, and that's that's all speculative. But now now kind of my thoughts on the. The album itself, opening up with the uh, the kind of faux live setting, where uh, he, he's playing this kind of uh, dopey song, lyrics like something like "I won't be a sex machine," and and to me it's it's obvious that this uh, this bit's a little bit of a, a gaff, a bit of a gag, because especially with with what follows. Um, and yeah, I think, I think what's, what's so impressive to me about this album is that I, I really dig the atmosphere, despite the obviously very limited, uh, recording methods, uh, 2000 BC, our proper opener, the BC standing for brain cells as, uh, the song goes by, uh, 2000 brain cells ago being the kind of, uh, choral part of this song. And, and this is something very essential to the experience of this album, that it is, in a lot of its lyrical content, very much about the abuse of, of uh, recreational drugs and how that has affected our protagonist, how he's using it as this method to combat his depression. And I, I feel for what it does, it never really gets too preachy with these lyrical themes. I think it always stays in this, in, in a lane where kind of like, uh, and this is not a an album I'm comparing for sound, but for uh, kind of that same thing, but uh, de-loused in the comatorium of an album that is very much anti-drug without ever getting into that territory of like just eye rolling. Um, the influences I think are very fascinating as uh, Tyler has pointed out many of. I think another other ones that strike me are a bit like uh, a bit of the dub and reggae stuff. I think a lot of that's present here with the very just hazy instrumental tones. Uh, Brand New Day is, of course, the first track to feature the pitch-shifted vocals, which, uh, as Jake and Morgan have pointed out, I, I really adore these skits. I think, yeah, for the most part, they're generally funny, and I think they give us a great kind of sense of not just personality, but personalities across this record. It's very, uh, it's very, very funny. I think it's great that we've got this character who constantly needs to reassure our main character of himself despite uh being a bit of a, a pinhead himself uh not quite grasping a lot of what's being conveyed uh yeah i think i yeah and in the middle of brand new day i think the the sketch kind of fun and I love the the very hypnotic way this this track closes out with the the multiple layers of pitch shifted vocals kind of washing over the top of each other. I thought that was very sick. Uh, yeah, lyric wise, already spoke on that. Uh, yeah, uh, sketches really good. Uh, I think a lot of the 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 radio stuff really funny in uh, not over you. Better Days, I think, is an absolutely explosively fun song with just this great 
propulsive energy to it. Uh, it goes back to my point about the kind of how I feel the influences across this record are all so well integrated uh, to this to this album. And Ode to My Favorite Beers takes a wildly different sonic approach, being much more guitar driven in contrast to Better Days, which has these much more loud uh, cymbal hits. It's a really, uh, really cool contrast, I think. Uh, and the sampling on this album does sampling in a way that is very unconventional for a lot of hip hop at the time. I think that sets it apart a great deal. Uh, and although as Tyler pointed out, uh, Hair is I think easily the, the worst song on here with the, the all too common uh, hip hop song with female moaning in the background, which it, it happened a lot in that time. And uh, I can't think of one song it aged particularly well on at all. Yeah. 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 I didn't like it when uh, Fleetwood Mac did it on the opener of Tango in the Night. I don't like it here. No, it's not. It's not Outcast bad. can't do it. You can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's just that that's its own topic of like it it's never made sense to me why was this a thing i'm glad we're done with it for the most part uh yeah evening news i think you guys have all all touched on really well uh i love the way i i love a, there's a really kind of subtle thing going on here where in the actual singing portions of this song the news footage itself is reversed, but in the spoken word portions, it's going uh, forward. So I thought that was a nice little touch to the song, added to my enjoyment of a bit of the, the, the finer details on this record, which there, there are some nice moments like that, despite this obviously very lo-fi, dirty recording method. Uh, and yeah, I think, uh, and contrary to Sersha though, I think the ending sketch of these two guys going back and forth is, is quite fun, uh, as with most things here. Uh, finally, of course, we get, well, not finally, but we get to the, <laughs> the title track, uh, Play With Toys. What a song. Which, yeah, most kind of easily the most thickly tonal piece on here. I thought uh, the layers of instrumentals uh, felt very kind of almost cluttered, but I, I can really appreciate the sonic uh, sonic ambition going into that part. I thought that worked out considerably well, despite the obviously very lo-fi qualities of this. And uh, finally, I think, and the outro of course, takes us kind of back to this live setting and I think this is, th this song's great. I love the part where uh, he, he's like, thank you very much. And some guy says, finally, it's over. And then he's like, shut up. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you. Of <laughs> course, that, that's, that's a very standout moment for me of like, it's very, uh, very good, good bit. And I like the, the joke that, He's like from the stage hitting on this girl in the audience while mm -hmm. trying to- him talk about your girl like that? Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't while... even rhyme. I'm thinking about the gun in my face. While, while trying to avoid getting the shit kicked out of him <laughs> yep. while he's singing this song. It's <sighs> like a concept I've never seen done before and I, it's just hilarious. Uh, yeah. But yeah, the, the humor, it works exceptionally well for me. I think it's uh, mm. it's quite balanced in equal measures of the serious and the funny stuff, which I think adds a really great overall tone to this record. Um, I yeah, uh, it, it's just something I I wish hadn't really been forgotten because I think there's 
even though it does definitely click its heels a bit in the back half, it's something I think that is interesting enough that it warrants discussion and even a, a second look from a lot of people, which I feel it is sadly not gotten from being lost to the annals of time. And even in my explanation of why I think that is, I can't find like a concrete answer for just what happened. And that's about what I thought. Yeah. yeah well, I am happy you introduced this to me because good Lord knows I wouldn't have heard it otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think whopping it, eight ratings on Sputnik Music. <laughs> One of which great, is. I think me. it's great to be shouting out something like this that is forgotten, but important in its own way. And perhaps with a, an audience that, or like it, 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 the people who will like this record might just not be aware that it exists. Like, and yeah. yeah. And I think it, it has the potential for a reevaluation. Um, even even though I have some reservations about it for myself, I can see the appeal. Uh, yeah, it's got an audience. Totally. Yeah, and I it, it's just weird because a lot of the audience for this just yeah doesn't know it exists, mm. which is a problem. Let's do our favorite tracks. Oh. Indeed, my three favorite tracks are "Brand New Day." I try and the title track. Uh, my least favorite track is here, and I'm going to give this album a six out of ten. Nice. Yeah. Um, so my favorite tracks are uh, I'm going to say "Play with Toys," uh, ba -ba -da, uh, "Not Over You," um, and let's go "Better Days." Uh, my least favorite track. Uh, don't force me to pick, and um, they're all quite good. Um, maybe hair, but it's a good song. I'm going to give this record an eight and a half out of ten. Uh, my three favorites are Not Over You, uh, Brand New Day, and Evening News. Least favorite is Hair. Uh, I'm going to go a seven out of ten. Neato. Uh, um, well, my three favorite tracks would have to be uh, 2000 BC, um, Brand New Day, and Play With Toys. I'd give this a seven and a half. Nice. So that just leaves Jake. Well, my three favorite tracks are um, uh, Evening News, not over you and brand new day. My least favorite track is hair, and uh, I give it a seven point five. My name oh. is Pee Wee Dee Dee. <laughs> <laughs> you can call me Pee Wee. So that gives us an average of uh, seven point three out of ten, um, wow. which lines up with Shame and Destroy, English Settlement, quite nicely. All right. So yeah, that's. Uh... That's this uh, chill. That's this episode. episode. Uh, what's next week's record club? That's a good question. It's Sersha's record club next week. Oh, another, yeah, that's right. Another more obscure record um, from the. Do you want to? You can give a wee bit of a hint of <laughs> Obscure sure. indie artist Gerard Way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, basically, after My Chemical Romance broke up, Gerard Way released this strange kind of Brit pop shoegaze thing as a solo record. Um, and I can't wait to hear what you all think of it. Yeah, awesome. so we're going to cover that, and um, yeah. 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 Um, so <laughs> yes, we'll be covering that, and next week, obviously we, obviously, we have talked about new records this week. We talked about a new record from Shame, and we talked about a new record from Viagra Boys, that's it. Uh, <laughs> already forgotten. Uh, but, Viagra Jazz. But we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun talking about them. We were joined by a special guest too. So definitely go and check that out. Rock over London. Rock on Chicago. AMC. Story matters here. I have herpes. <laughs>